starts right now. First up tonight, a neighborhood shake it up after seven people were shot overnight. Two of those victims now dead from the shooting over on the city's south side. People in the area tell the night team's Lee Waldman that gunfire that sounded like fireworks was enough for them to question when the violence will end. The yellow crime scene tape still blowing in the wind. The barbecue pit cold in the driveway. I told my husband, was that fireworks? He goes, no, that was a gun. There was some gunshots. Yeah, like it sounds like fireworks because none of that ever happens here. Neither of these neighbors wanted to show their faces. They're shaken up by what happened last night on their street. A family barbecue turning deadly. I still hear the little girl screaming. She was just you know, screaming and I could hear a lady screaming. And I mean, it was it was like a nightmare. SAPD Chief William McManus says two men age 45 and 46 died in the shooting on Patron Drive near I-35 South and Palo Alto. Five other people were hurt and taken to the hospital. It's the second drive by to happen at the house in two months, according to Chief McManus. I don't even know what to do. But it's it's scary. It's scary to know that something, I mean, happened so close, so close. It's, it's always around, but it's never in our neighborhood at all. So, like I said, it's a big shock having it, it, having it on my street, too. You know, big shock. A man outside of the home was visibly upset, looking at the sky, asking why and saying my sons. At this time, the medical examiner's office hasn't confirmed the identity of the two victims killed and police are still looking for the person or people responsible. You're not safe anywhere, you know, not even at church, not even at school. So it's getting bad. It's getting worse. Last night, Chief McManus mentioned that his department is continuing to work with criminologists at UTSA to create a violent crime prevention plan. He said a crime like the one we saw last night is random but targeted. So he says these types of violent acts are tough to prevent. Live at Public Safety Headquarters, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. Meanwhile, lawmakers on Capitol Hill continue to say they are working to transform their agreed upon framework into an actual bill. Ten Republicans signed on to the deal so far, enough to break the filibuster and get a bill passed in the Senate. The tentative deal would strengthen background checks for gun buyers under 21, close a so-called boyfriend loophole and place gun restrictions on convicted domestic violence abusers, as well as some with domestic violence restraining orders against them, provide funding for states to enact red flag laws, uh, which allow guns to be taken from someone considered dangerous by a court and bolsters school security and mental health programs. Senators have about two weeks to get a vote on their package before they break for recess on June 27th. A developing story tonight. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office still working to identify a man found dead at a house party on the far west side. San Antonio police responded to the house around 1 a.m. on Rimhurst Drive. That's near Culebra Road and 1604. The man was pronounced dead there at the scene. Police say the people inside the home quickly tried to run away, but they were able to detain a few of them for questioning. Three people are grateful to have safely escaped uh, from a house fire over on the southeast side. That fire broke out around 3 o'clock this afternoon on Aransas Avenue near South New Braunfels and I-10. Fire officials say one person was inside the home at the time of the fire. Two others who lived there arrived shortly after and were able to help that resident escape. The fourth person was not home at the time. Fire officials say that home is about 60% damaged. The cause of that fire not yet released. A traffic violation led to the arrest of two men accused of driving stolen motorcycles while carrying guns and drugs. 27-year-old Jesse Trevino and 39-year-old Antonio Flores are both facing charges. Bear County deputies say they were pulled over at a gas station. That's where deputies found they were each carrying guns illegally, along with 5.9 grams of marijuana. From victim to victorious, after 13 years of domestic violence, a San Antonio woman is finally free. Just months into her recovery, she's now finding her voice and using it for good. In July, she'll be the keynote speaker for a violence awareness event, and she hopes it'll be the start of a lifelong journey to heal by helping others. It's part of my series confronting domestic violence, Loving in Fear. From the first day, he was abusive. Anju K says the day she got married at 18 years old in India, she lost her freedom. She says it got worse when her ex-husband brought her and their two children to live in San Antonio. He became a monster to me. He became a numb person. The way he was hitting me. The way he raped me. She said the violence landed her family in the hospital. 
I opened up in front of doctors. They called the CPS and we were told not to go back to home. Then I made a decision to go to the shelter. The doors opened with kindness. I started my life one year back in Better Women's Shelter. I was there for nine months. I was reborn there. Part of her healing is helping. In January, she started a blog and website that has reached other survivors. People from Australia, UK, Canada, Pakistan, India. She says being a survivor is a feeling of pride. Help is available, but you have to reach out. And reaching out doesn't mean just reach out, call number and no response. Don't give up. Keep knocking, keep knocking till someone listen to you. Anju is set to be the keynote speaker at a July 1st violence awareness event hosted by the San Antonio Indian Nurses Association. She hopes to communicate what it's like to go from victim to survivor and inspire others to do the same. For more information, head to ksat.com. Members of the Juneteenth Coalition, along with several voting advocacy groups, are looking ahead to the November elections and making sure every vote is cast. They spoke to the community about the importance of knowing how to properly submit mail-in ballots so they won't be rejected. More than 12 percent of mail-in ballots were rejected under the new Texas voting rules during the March primary. That's according to the Texas Tribune. Bear County saw nearly 2,000 rejections. A lot of them coming down to the change in the new application form and people putting information in the wrong sections. About the importance of the voting process and getting involved in our communities. We ask our people, to, uh, people in our community to get involved, to get registered to vote. We still have time and to help us educate everyone in the process of voting correctly. And just a reminder here in Texas, the only people who can vote by mail are those who are 65 and older, sick and disabled, out of state college students and service members who are stationed out of their home county. For a complete breakdown of the new rules and to see what mistakes others made to get their ballots rejected, just head over to KSAT.com. And a reminder, the last day to register to vote in November is October 11th. A school district in our area has gone from being one of the lowest performing school districts to one of the highest in just two years. That district, Southside ISD. This morning, as part of our Leading SA segment, we spoke with Superintendent Rolando Ramirez. Southside ISD had a C rating in 2019 and now sits at an A rating. Ramirez says the staff and students were determined to boost that rating despite the challenges that came with COVID. The ones joining remotely, we struggled with internet connectivity because here at Southside, we don't have the internet infrastructure. With the students that were attending in person, well, you know, unfortunately, some would get sick, uh, staff as well. Uh, some had COVID exposures, so they'd be out. Uh, so our attendance was very low. But our students and staff, you know, met the challenge, uh, overcame every obstacle that they confronted, and we never made excuses. Good for them. To watch the full interview or any of our past Leading SA interviews, just head to KSAT.com. Click on the Leading SA tab. Wrapping up the weekend as we look outside with live cam tonight. It's warm out there, but very breezy. If you've spent any time outside at all this evening, you know that that breeze has really helped us out because we're still sitting close to 90 degrees at this hour. We did make it up to 100 this afternoon, just three degrees shy of the record high temperature for today. 103 that record originally set back in 1918. So with a triple digit day at the airport, that is 16 100 degree days for us here in San Antonio. This year, it looks like this is going to be just a record breaking summer, especially in terms of triple digit heat. So looking ahead to this week, probably no big surprise. The heat does continue, but we will carry a low chance of rain tomorrow and Tuesday. I'll give you a look at future cast, tell you why that is. And I've also got the latest Saharan dust outlook for the week ahead. That and more coming up in just a little bit. Honey Creek Cave, have you heard of it? Well, to some, it's considered one of the most important caves in Texas, and KSAT gets an exclusive look inside. Plus, knocked from their high pedestal, we see what made some normally high-score restaurants fail in this week's Behind the Kitchen Door. And a Father's Day event brings local families together that have a special connection. That story, right after the break.
While many people get to celebrate Father's Day with their dads, others are celebrating their memories and their legacies. Here in Military City, USA, that's true for many families of service members. The night team's Camilla Juarez tells us why families continue to participate in an annual event honoring fallen fathers. <laughs> Marisol Deck lost her husband Christopher in July of last year from a heart attack. He was an Air Force Master Sergeant that Deck wished more people could have met. He was just amazing, like um, father, husband, mentor, um, friend. Um, he touched so many people's lives. Um, he was amazing at his job. Deck and her two kids recently moved to San Antonio and though the transition has been hard, she's still taking time out on Father's Day to celebrate him. That we're not alone, that there are people that understand and that are there willing to help us through our grieving process. Like Deck, many other service member families participated in the fourth annual Remembering Fallen Fathers Family Day at SeaWorld San Antonio. The event is designed to connect families going through the same pain. We're so excited and um, I told them it was an organization that you know, is helping us give, you know, be able to have that opportunity. They were so excited because they know they knew automatically, oh, there's going to be other Gold Star families or there's going to be other people that that get us. That's, that's their thing that they say that they understand what we're going through. I love they have blue beaks. Cristan Alvarez lost his father long before he could remember. So being around other Gold Star families helps him understand the sacrifice his father made. It's sad, but at least they have something to distract them so they won't be sad on Father's Day. Dex says her family is still healing and is grateful to be surrounded by a community. Just sharing our, our, our stories and um, remembering our, our loved ones, it's just very important for us. Today's event was hosted by Tuesday's Children, a nonprofit that serves military families through various programs and services, as well as providing a support system. We have more information about the services they offer on our website. All right, thank you, Camelia. And of course, we want to wish a happy Father's Day to our very own. Well, thank you. Tim Gerber. Happy Just one fathers. of the fathers around here. Just thank one you. of the fathers, yes. <laughs> one of many. And if you're out there doing stuff with Dad, you know, not a bad place to be at a water park or somewhere <laughs> oh getting gosh. splashed because it was hot again. I'm running out of ways to say hot. I know you are too, uh, but I guess we'll just set our sights yes. on breaking all the records. Um, you know what? I want, It was a couple of weeks ago when this heat wave was really kind of kicking in. I, yeah. I looked up synonyms for the word hot, and there were like 45. So oh, good. Let's start. We may start, yeah, we may start pulling from, uh, from that list here shortly. Heat will continue to be the big story when it comes to the forecast in the week ahead. And here's what you can expect if you're planning your week. High temperatures there, that middle column, triple digits all the way through next weekend. Really the only two days that will be kind of different will be tomorrow and Tuesday where we have a low, low chance of a few stray pop up showers in the late afternoon and early evening hours. We had a little activity on the radar closer to sunset uh, blink and you'll miss it. But there were some little blips of yellow there moving northwest. Those were some very, very brief and small showers that were pacing through again around uh, sunset a little bit before that earlier today. Otherwise, things are quiet out there now. Skies are clear to mostly clear. Still low 90s from Del Rio down to Eagle Pass. It's 89 in Hondo, 87 in Pleasanton, also 87 there in Gonzales, 89 New Braunfels, also 89 at the airport, so still very warm. But as I mentioned, we've got a pretty good breeze in most spots. Calm winds from Comfort down to Bandera. Everyone else, a southeasterly wind at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. So that breeze is there to help us out, and the breeze will hang around for the next couple of days. Check out high temperatures across the country today. Not often you see this. Our high temperature here in San Antonio, the same as the high temperature today in Bismarck, North Dakota. Now, even 100 today is above average for us, way above average for Bismarck this time of year. There's a big dome of heat here through the central part of the country. And notice that's also where things are pretty quiet. There is some rain and some thunderstorm activity starting to work into parts of the northern plains and 
here's what's going on as we look at the big picture. The heat high is centered off to our northeast. We've got upper level low pressure or a big trough here over the western United States. That's helping to push some of that rain and storm activity into the northern plains tonight. Unfortunately, that's a bit too far west for us to cash in on any of that good rain. We will continue to be more influenced by this ridge of high pressure or the heat high in the week ahead. But what's different about the next couple of days, Monday into Tuesday, that heat high will be centered off to our northeast just far enough away that it will leave some room for some stray pop up, some showers, maybe a very weak brief storm over the next couple of afternoons. So Monday and Tuesday, we'll leave in a low chance for rain late afternoon, early evening. As soon as the sun goes down, Anything that gets going will quickly fizzle out by Wednesday this week and then the back half heading into the weekend. Just hot again as the heat high moves back in overhead and kind of centers itself over Texas. So our only opportunities for rain come early this week and they are very, very slim. Please don't get your hopes up because most of us will miss out. Unfortunately, as far as the Saharan dust outlook goes for this week or the forecast uh, skies have been clear this weekend. I expect them to stay clear as far as the Saharan dust goes tomorrow. Some very light concentrations of dust beginning to work in on Tuesday and then light concentrations Wednesday, Thursday picking up a bit as we get toward the end of the week and the upcoming weekend. So not a whole lot of dust for most of this week. It looks like it could start to pick up uh, as we get closer closer to next weekend, but of course we will keep you updated there. Here's what you can expect for your Monday clouds in the morning, warm and muggy out the door, mid to upper 70s for your low temperatures, 91 by lunchtime, mostly sunny and hot again tomorrow afternoon, a nice breeze, southeasterly winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. And as we've been talking about 10% chance of a stray late afternoon pop up, keep your fingers crossed. It's kind of like a Playing the weather lottery, if you will. <laughs> it's fun, right? I'll just, I'll just, we're, we should bring our thesaurus here to the desk. Well, my wife got me some lottery tickets today, and I did not do well oh. on the scratch off, so I'm not playing weather lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Katie. All right. Economy experts say a recession could be in our future, but why they say it might not necessarily be a bad thing. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen does not believe a recession is inevitable, but many on Wall Street believe that's exactly what could happen within the next 12 to 18 months. Here's ABC's Deirdre Bolton with the details. With several factors putting pressure on the economy, many on Wall Street are betting on a recession sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. But Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen believes a recession is not inevitable. I expect the economy to slow uh, it's been growing at a very rapid rate as the economy, as the labor market has recovered and we have reached full employment. It's natural now that we expect a transition to steady and stable growth. The Federal Reserve is taking aggressive action to address rising inflation. Overall spending is strong, is strong although patterns of spending um, are changing and higher food and energy prices are um, certainly affecting consumers. Consumer prices are at a 40 year high. COVID continues to impact supply chains and Russia's invasion of Ukraine could create a world food crisis. That war has also helped push gas prices to record levels. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm will be meeting with oil executives this week. She tells CNN President Biden is prepared to use his authority to help increase supply, but offered no guarantee gas prices will decline. We know this is going to be a tough summer because driving season just started mm -hmm. and we know that there will be continued upward uh, pull on demand. The job market remains strong with unemployment at 3.6 percent, according to the Labor Department. Businesses are looking for ways to attract and keep workers. Vicki Dickerson is offering $500 bonuses and raises to help her employees keep up with inflation. Hopefully people will be a little bit happy. This won't change their life forever or anything like that. If the country does experience a recession, it's worth noting that recessions don't last forever and they are usually followed by a period of strong growth. Deirdre Bolton, ABC News, New York. 
All right, the most important week in franchise history since the Spurs made Tim Duncan their number one overall pick in 1997. With more of what's on instant replay tonight, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. That sounds pretty important. Yeah, because it's the NBA draft, a chance yes. to continue on their rebuilding program. That's because the Spurs have not one, not two, but three picks in the first round on the NBA draft. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. The ninth pick goes to the San Antonio Spurs. Not since the Spurs made Tim Duncan the number one overall pick in 1997 has there been a bigger draft night in Spurs franchise history. Armed with the number 9, 20, and 25th pick in the first round. Now the only question is who will the Spurs select on Thursday night in Brooklyn? They go back to the ISO to Valanciunas. Having his way inside. Before that happens, we'll examine the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Spurs season that ended with another failure to make the playoffs. How does this all affect how the Spurs use their draft choices? 3-2 again. In the air, left field, falling fast in front of Kennedy. Rock scores, and this game is tied. And what did you think of the rivalry renewed in the elimination game between the Longhorns and the Aggies of the College World Series? We'll show you how it ended. And fight night is around the corner. We'll have the interviews with the world champion Jesse Bam Rodriguez and Rick Medina, who is fighting for his first title belt. All that plus who survives to win the U.S. Open in golf. And what should the Spurs do with their top three picks in the first round of the NBA draft? Tonight, you decide. Instant Replay is live and is right after the night, Pete. Pick the next big three? Absolutely. You hope. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Greg. All right, still to come on the night beat, we go behind the kitchen door to check up on some restaurants known for their high scores in the past, but this time they fell flat. And travel troubles continue this Father's Day and Juneteenth weekend. What union experts say is to blame for all the flight cancellations and delays. A trio of restaurants with histories of high health scores saw those numbers fall into the 70s after recent inspections. Yeah, I went behind the kitchen door to see what made them fall so far. Our first stop this week is First Stop, located in the 2500 block of East Houston Street. In December last year, they earned a respectable score of 90, but when inspectors returned last month, they ended up with a 76. The inspector found eggs and butter that had been left out overnight. Instead of the required temperature of 41 or below, those items were measured at 75 degrees. Cheese in the mini fridge had mold on it, so it was thrown out. Food contacted surfaces were covered in grease and food residue. A calcium lime rust chemical was on the food prep counter, and there was rat fecal matter in the cabinet under the soda fountain. Four of the violations were corrected on site, but the business still earned a reinspection. El Taco Rodeo de Alisco in the 8800 block of Petranco came in with a score of 79, a big drop from its past two inspections, which earned them a 98 last summer and a 96 earlier this year. Proper cleaning methods led to the low score this time around. The inspector noting the sanitizing compartment where dishes are washed didn't have the proper amount of bleach, and it was way too high in another area used for cloth towels used by waitresses. There was a leaky pipe in the kitchen draining into a bucket of cloth towels used for cleaning, and the inspector saw employees using towels to wipe down dirty surfaces without placing them in the sanitizing solution. They were re-inspected. Hacienda Vallarta in the 9800 block of Marbach saw its previous scores of 91 and 90 take a nosedive down to 79. An employee was using bare hands to cut onions, there were live flies in the kitchen, and raw shrimp, fish, and eggs were found sitting on shelves above cooked and ready to eat foods. Two of the violations were repeats, earning the business a reinspection. Several restaurants also got perfect scores, lots of those. To see who did a good job, use your phone to scan that QR code on your screen. It'll take you right to our perfect scores database over at KSAT.com. Well, as millions take to the skies for Father's Day and the Juneteenth long holiday weekend, many are finding chaos at airports across the nation. On Friday, the TSA screened more than 2.4 million travelers, the most since Thanksgiving weekend last year. Soaring demand along with severe weather on the Northeast on Thursday caused a ripple effect that has continued throughout the weekend. Yesterday alone, more than 3,500 U.S. flights were either delayed or canceled. They don't have enough pilots. They haven't trained enough pilots. They are literally canceling flights because they don't have their act together. Labor shortages are having an impact because if there are delays or cancellations, 
flight crews time out because they can only be on the clock for so long. Some airlines have already trimmed their summer flight schedules, hoping to prevent future system-wide meltdowns. From airplanes to space rockets now, SpaceX pulls off a record-breaking three successful launches in 36 hours. The final of the three launches took place at 1.27 a.m. from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida today. Global Star Satellite Launch capped the fastest three-flight sequence for an orbit-class rocket in modern space history. The SpaceX trifecta started Friday when a Falcon 9 rocket took off from the Kennedy Space Center with a batch of Starlink satellites. 22 hours later on Saturday, another Falcon 9 took off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. All right, outside with live cam again, looking off to the northwest here. This is I-10 heading west. Uh, looks like a pretty night out there. It's warm, but we've got a nice breeze in place. If you're getting ready to send the kiddos out the door to uh, summer camp or activities tomorrow, yeah, it's going to be another hot day. 77 at 8 o'clock, already at 91 by noon, and then topping out tomorrow afternoon around 100 degrees. Thankfully, we'll have another good breeze in place. Expect winds, especially by the afternoon and evening hours, back near about 10 to 20 miles per hour. So send the kiddos with some water, also with some sunscreen. Extreme UV index readings tomorrow afternoon. Sun damage could occur in as little as 10 minutes without that sunscreen. More about your forecast in the week ahead coming up here in just a bit. Courtney. 80? Well, did Pixar's latest animated adventure soar to infinity and beyond, or was it stomped out by the dino competition? Brar! There's a hint. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> and it's described as one of the most important caves throughout Texas. In case that got to see inside, up next we explain what makes the Honey Creek Cave so special. I was going to make a bat sound, but I don't know what that sounds like. <laughs> Just recently, the owners of Honey Creek Spring Ranch in Comal County reached a conservation easement agreement with the Nature Conserv Conservancy and Texas Parks and Wildlife. That agreement is crucial because that piece of land, which is home to Honey Creek, is also well your where you will find Honey Creek Cave. It's the longest and some argue one of the most important caves in the state. While it's not open to the public, meteorologists Sarah Spivey and Justin Horn got a chance to check it out. We are at Honey Creek Spring Ranch, pristine land that has just been protected by a conservation easement. The land here looks exactly as it did 200 years ago. It's been in this family five to six generations and it really is untouched and it's beautiful. It's still my favorite cave and it's still impressive to me even after all these trips. It's still an incredibly impressive cave. So this is our first time yeah. kind of going in something like this. Advice? Um, keep your head above water where you can. Uh, be careful, go slow. Cur uh, it's a 100% success record. Everybody's gone in and come out. Okay, Good. so we, we expect to continue that record today. I don't remember exactly how many times I've been in here, but it's well over 200. This section that we're doing today is one of the most decorated parts of the cave. It's 15, 20 feet wide, over your head deep for most all of it. And there's formations that come down from the ceiling into the water. So you have to weave your way through them in a lot of places. When you get up here, push your floaty stuff through, and then I'll give you my, my hand and I'll pull you through. There are a number of species in the cave, some aquatic, uh, some terrestrial. There are bats in the cave. It's the longest cave in the state. Uh, it's a major discharge point for the Trinity Aquifer. So Justin and I are 1,500 feet into Honey Creek Cave, about 80 feet below the surface. And we've made it to this fascinating piece of this waterfall here. If you were to keep going, the cave would go on for another 20 miles. I've enjoyed being able to explore it all these years, and I hope that, that future generations of cavers can also in, enjoy it uh, and continue to add to its survey. Sarah, what you think? Amazing. And the water was so cool. It was beautiful to actually be in the aquifer. We recognized how important this piece of property was. If they had decided to do the other thing, to, to sell it, um, the, the only people that could have afforded it would have been developers. And we might have houses right up on top of that spring, which would have diminished uh, everything about it. They have been 
some of the most incredible owners of any cave in this country. There could hardly be anything more important to the humans living in this area than to protect our water supply. And by protecting the land over the aquifer, you're protecting the water. And while you're doing that, you're also protecting wildlife. That was so cool. So cool and so brave. I don't think I could do that with my claustrophobia. I was having anxiety over here. That was Sarah and Spivey and Justin Horn reporting. Such a great story. To read more about their experience in this cave or just more details about that gorgeous cave, head to ksat.com. We'll be right back. I'm going to a conference later this week to learn things. Katie went to a conference last week is going to share some things that she learned. We learned some things. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> learned a lot. It was a broadcast meteorology conference that was up in Milwaukee. Adam Kowski got to attend as well and learned a lot. But one thing that stuck out to me was they had the local meteorologists from Milwaukee kind of introduce us to the city, give us some fun facts. And they told us about a type of cold front they have up there and they call them pneumonia fronts. I know that seems a little crass. Let me explain. So up near the Great Lakes here, up near Wisconsin, every now and then they get their cold fronts that come in from the northeast and they call these backdoor cold fronts because typically cold fronts move in from the northwest, but occasionally they get one of these backdoor cold fronts that moves in from the northeast as it drops south along the Great Lakes it speeds up over the water because of a lack of friction over the water versus land. So you get this nose of very, very cold air that drops down and can affect places like Sheboygan, but also Milwaukee. Now for a cold front to be classified as a pneumonia front, and this is just a local term. It was made up by the National Weather Service office there in the 1960s, and it just kind of stuck. Uh, to be classified as a pneumonia front, the temperature must drop at least 16 degrees in one hour, but the local meteorologists there were telling us that it's more like 20 to 30 degrees in an hour when these very steep temperature drops come through. So just a little local meteorology that I picked up from there in Milwaukee that I wanted to bring back to you here. And my thought was that also maybe it would help you think cooler thoughts, colder thoughts, uh, if not just for a minute or two. Uh, we are a long way away from cold front season. Here were your high temperatures today. Again, our average at uh, the airport is 93. We got up to 100 today. 102 in Pleasanton, 96 Kerrville, and 100 in Del Rio. A lot of us are still hovering near 90 at this hour. It's 89 along Highway 90 from Hondo over to Uvalde, still 92 in Del Rio. 89 up I-35 in New Braunfels right now, 85 in Comfort, 84 Bernie Stage. Skies are clear out there. We had a few quick hitting showers. I mean, they were teeny tiny. Uh, they moved uh, northwest right as the sun was going down, but uh, all quiet out there now. And again, skies are clear to mostly clear. Overnight, we'll see some low clouds build in from the south. More cloud covers expected generally along and south of Highway 90. So some clouds to start the day tomorrow. Light southerly winds, warm and muggy. Your out the door temperatures mid to upper 70s. It is going to be very sticky as we get into the afternoon. Mostly sunny skies um, and check out this future cast model. It again as we get into the late afternoon and early evening hours wants to bring in some of these stray pop up showers and this will be possible tomorrow and then again on Tuesday. But notice coverage here is very, very limited. Most of us will not see rain over the next couple of afternoons, but I can't rule out a quick hitting pop up shower again late in the afternoon into the early evening hours. Otherwise hot again tomorrow with your high temperatures generally back near 100 degrees. Look for a high around 99 Bull Verde, 101 Port SA, 101 Gonzales and 99 up in Canyon Lake. So our rainfall potential through the next week, you can kind of see how models are picking up on those stray pop ups uh, that will generally be south and east of San Antonio. But overall, just know that rainfall potential over the next week is minimal. And you can almost see where the heat high has set up here over Texas, Oklahoma uh, and parts of Arkansas with a dramatic lack of rainfall in the cards over the next week. Quick check of the tropics. Nothing new happening out there. No new development is expected over the next two to five days. Another look at your Monday around San Antonio 76 in the morning, 91 at lunchtime, 100 tomorrow, mostly sunny and keep your eyes peeled. Keep your eyes on radar in the case that weather authority app for a little pop up shower the next couple of afternoons, guys.
Thanks for sharing the knowledge on the Great Lakes. I'd never heard that. That's before. fascinating. Must yeah. be that side of the Great Lakes. <laughs> all right, coming up, burgers, space, and dinosaurs. All things in my dreams last night? No, just kidding. <laughs> we'll find out. They were all at the box <laughs> office. We'll see who won. Guess the dino's probably not hungry, is my guess. <laughs>
beautiful voices. That's all of our time for now for all of us here at KSAT 12. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to tune in to Good Morning San Antonio for all your latest overnight news. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there and an all new instant replay starts right now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Here's hoping you had a great Father's Day to all the dads out there. This week promises to be one of the biggest in Spurs franchise history. For the first time since selecting Tim Duncan with the number one overall pick back in 1997 NBA draft, the Spurs will have top 10 pick. But that's not all. The silver and black will actually have three first round draft picks in the 2022 NBA draft this Thursday. Thanks to trades that will go along with a way of rebuilding the Spurs and what could very well be the final year for five time NBA champion Greg Popovich as their head coach. All right now that the Warriors have wrapped up the season with their three straight wins over the Boston Celtics to be crowned the NBA champs for the fourth time in eight years, it's time to look forward to the future in this week's NBA draft. That's where the Spurs will be armed with the 9th, the 20th, and 25th overall picks. Three picks in the top 25, the last two thanks to trades. The 20th with the Toronto Raptors for Thaddeus Young and the 25th from Boston for the Derek White swap on trade deadline day. But that's not all. Here's a look besides those three picks in the first round, the 9th, the 20th, and the 25th. They also have the 38th pick in the second round. So here's some possibilities for you to consider with those top three picks here. Jalen Duran out of Memphis. He's a freshman. How about a forward Terry Eason LSU with a 20th pick and then a guard Christian Brown out of Kansas for that 25th and final pick. Now that leads us to what the Spurs need to work on going forward. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly for the silver and black. Let's start first with the good and what the Spurs can build off of. This is after the Spurs failed to make the playoffs of the third straight season. The good, obviously, DeJounte Murray, who had an all-star season. He finished with 13 triple-doubles this season for a total of 18 in his career. He was named to his first ever all-star game while scoring career highs in two-point shooting, over 50%, while averaging 21.1 points per game, 19.2 assists, 8.3 rebounds to go along with his, of course, 8.3 assists. Now, the bad, Jakob Pertl's contract expiring at the end of this coming season. The Spurs are exposed for not having a backup center they could count on. The 2022 NBA draft can help solve that problem, but there's also a decision looming for Lonnie Walker IV, who is a restricted free agent this offseason, which means the Spurs will have to match any offer that Walker receives from another team or not if they don't want to keep him. The Ugly clearly failing to make the playoffs for a franchise record third straight time, unable to win a play-in game thanks to their 113-103 loss to the Orleans Pelicans that saw the Spurs down by as many as 21 points and that was without Zion Williamson who missed the entire season with a foot injury as a result the Spurs finished 10th overall 34 and 48 in the regular season and they landed ninth in the NBA draft lottery so here how it all unfolds in Brooklyn New York this will be on Thursday at 7 p.m. you can see the first round of the draft live here on case at 12 we'll have our own Larry Ramirez right there on the floor. Time now for tonight's instant replay poll question. What should the Spurs do with their first round draft picks? Draft all three first round picks, trade one first round pick, or trade two first round picks? Vote now. We'll have the results at the end of the broadcast tonight. The biggest rivalry in the Lone Star State takes center stage in Omaha for the College World Series. Texas versus Texas AM in the loser's bracket. Winner stays alive. Loser goes home. Longhorns jump out quickly here. Top of the second. Doug Hodo, the third out of Birdie. High school pulls a double down the left field line. Dylan Campbell scores 2 0 Texas. Ain't and answers right back at the bottom of the frame thanks to another Bernie native. Champions own Jordan Thompson. Skies one to left. That's going to find the gap. Troy Clonch heads home and we're tied at two all and not over yet. A few batters later, Trevor Werner drives a base hit into left center. Thompson scores along with Brett Minich. AM vaults ahead 4 2. That's all the run support they would need. Thompson finished the game two for two with two runs and two RBI. And the magical season for AM continues. They knock off the Longhorns 10 to 2 to remain alive in the College World Series. Collectively, we just put up, put together great at bats. Just kept making him make pitches and we took the balls and hit the strikes. I mean, nothing more he can do. The story of the game other than us is we made pitches to Melendez. I mean, it's first and third, nobody out and he's up in the, in the first inning. And then I think the next time he's up or the th third time he's up, the bases are loaded. So you know, it's Golden Spikes winner. And, you know, we ex executed pitches against him and he's a great hitter, going to have an awesome career. Um, but that was a massive part of the game. We all had the same goal and that was to, you know, have a dog pile at the end. It's, I don't think it's really truly hit me yet. We fight for this, and this is everything that we work for, you know, and it's just one of those things that we didn't get it done today, and, you know, we'll be all right. We'll, get, we'll be right back there. I know Coach Pierce will do a great job next year and get us back. All right, A&M advances to face Notre Dame in another winner-go-home game Tuesday at 1 p.m. 
Antonio FC finally played in the front of their home crowd at Toyota Field for the first time since late April, but it was the Oakland Roots SC who scored first in the 29th minute. SAFC tied it up at the first half stoppage time thanks to Samuel Aditaran, who was recently acquired by San Antonio, but that would be it, even though SAFC outshot Oakland 8-2 in the second half. Neither team could find the back of the net again, leading 1-1 draw. San Antonio only draw of the season so far. We were definitely the aggressors with and without the ball. Uh, disappointed. Uh, we didn't get the three points. I felt we earned the three points. I felt we dominated from start to finish. Um, you know, we our pressing actions were fantastic. Uh, created a number of clear-cut opportunities. Yes, you know, we like to execute. Um, you know, we'll learn from this. As soon as the, the second half started, from the from the halftime talk, the coach was just telling us that we got to keep pushing, keep keep pressing. You know, not giving them an inch to breathe. So, so yeah, from the from the start of the second half, had no fear, had no worries. But um, sadly, we just couldn't put it away. But hopefully, we can next time. All right, well, this is San Antonio's only draw this season. Colorado Springs Switchbacks FC won their match last night against the Indy 11. Now, Colorado now holds the first place spot with 33 points. SAFC is in second place with 31. Here's the info for the long-awaited match between the top two teams in the West. This will be at Colorado Springs Friday at 8 p.m. Final round of the U.S. Open at the Country Club at Brookline, Massachusetts. They ended up being a two-man battle between Matt Fitzpatrick and Will Salatours. Both were tied atop of the leaderboard at 500 until Fitzpatrick pulled ahead on the par 415. Check out the approach shot off the rough here, sticking it right onto the green. He would sink the birdie putt to move him to six under. Salatoris had a chance to match that with a long birdie putt here on the par 417, but he just comes up short of the cup and stays a stroke behind at five under. So we head to the 18th and Fitzpatrick is in a jam, chipping out of the bunker, no problem. He once again finds the green, a very perfect shot under pressure. He par the hole two putts later to put the pressure on Salatoris to match him, and it comes down to one one final stroke. Zalatoris Open is his first major golf championship and his first win on the PGA Tour. So here's a look at tallied up here. 600 wins it with a 274 over Will Salatoris and 5 under 275. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's just uh, the feelings out of this world. It's um, it's so cliche, but it's stuff you dream of as a kid and uh, having won the US Amateur here as well. I just felt so comfortable around this place. Uh, nowhere to hit it, nowhere to miss it. Um, and um, yeah, just happy to be uh, unbeaten around this place. It was fun watching his family's reaction. Now up next, fight week is here in the Alamo City. In, in my head, it was like, that, there's no way that's gonna happen. You know, to defend my title in San Antonio, that's something that every fighter wants to do and it's hard to, it's hard to do. So when it presented itself, it, I was just excited. And ever since I've just, I mean, I've been so anxious to just get in there already. Jesse Bam Rodriguez has returned home to defend his world title at the New Tech Port Center and Arena. We got your fight night preview of the DAZN broadcast that also features Lanier grad Rick Medina, who's preparing to fight for a couple of belts of his own. Plus, what should the Spurs do with their three first round draft picks? Can SAFC win against Colorado Springs? The sports guys decide, plus the missions get two walk-off wins this week, including today's Father's Day victory. When Instant Replay continues live next.